Oh, uh, well, uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, Nei te mihi ki te mana whenua. Uh, ko nai tua huriri, tēnā koutou. E nā waka, e nā mana, e nā reo, tēnā koutou katoa. E nā kai kōrero um, i tēnei pō, tēnā koutou. Uh, he kaia ko hau ke te whare wānanga o Waitaha, a uh, ke te kura umanga uh, hoki, uh, ko Stephen Hickson tōku ingoa. Uh, nō reira, uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora mai tātou, nau mai, haere mai, uh, ki tēnei zui uh, i tēnei pō. Um, so, uh, by brief way of introduction, uh, that was simply uh, welcome to you all, an acknowledgement of the local mana whenua, nai tua huriri, and then a greeting to uh, all of you who are here around this virtual room, uh, to the many of you gathered from afar and the many voices who are represented here. A greeting to our three panelists tonight. Uh, tēnā koutou, greetings to you. Um, and I'm a uh, lecturer at the University of, what, of, uh, of Canterbury in the School of Business. And my name is Stephen Hickson, and I will be the uh, facilitator to, uh, for uh, tonight. So, this evening, we're joined by members of the uh, University of Canterbury Business School community, including the MBA Graduates Association, and a special welcome to members of the New Zealand Institute of Directors too. Uh, just a reminder, a little bit of housekeeping here. Fortunately, I don't need to point out where the exits are, uh, but there are a couple of functions that you might want to know about. Uh, you are welcome to use the chat function and the question and answer function as well. Uh, we may address some of the things that uh, pop up as we go, that's perfectly fine, or we might leave them for the Q&A session at the end. We'll just kind of see how this thing runs. So it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's panelists. Uh, Rachel Tulele, Charlotte Walsh and Ben Reid. Three executives who are leading New Zealand based businesses that sell into global markets. So quite appropriate for the title of tonight's webinar, which is uh, Longer COVID, How Can New Zealand Businesses Succeed Overseas? So what we're going to do is um, I will introduce the three panelists, give them an opportunity to uh, talk a bit about themselves and answer a question. Then we'll have some questions uh, that I will put to them and a little bit of an exercise between the questions too, and uh, we'll just see how things run. So, uh, right, uh, Rachel will be up first. Rachel is uh, Nati Raukawa, Nati Rarua, Nati Kuata. She's a former US Trade Commissioner and founder of Yellow Brick Road Limited. Rachel has received awards, including the Sir Peter Blake Leadership Award, and she's a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to food and hospitality. Rachel chairs New Zealand's APEC Business Advisory Council and has served on the Prime Minister's Business Advisory Council. Her governance experience also includes the warehouse group and roles associated with primary industries, young people and leadership. She's a member of the New Zealand Institute of Directors. No, my heart my welcome, uh, Rachel. Tēnā koe kia koe. Um, Rachel, uh, you've just stepped down as CEO of Cornwall last week. Could you please tell us a little bit about the business and your experiences over the last 18 months and feel free to add anything you want to that very impressive CV that I have just read out there. So, uh, Rachel, over to you. Oh, tēnā koe, tēnā koutou katoa, tēnā te mihi mai o hāki o koutou katoa i tēnei pō. A real pleasure to be on here uh, this evening with the University of Canterbury and all of you, um, well, it just looks like a number actually, of number of participants, not quite sure who's online, but um, Great to be in your company this evening. And you're right, I have just jumped out of my role uh, as Chief Executive of Kono. Uh, I have well, I was there for six years, but I tried a number of roles at, at Wakatu Corporation, who's the only entity before I jumped into that one. It's a little bit like, um, is it Cinderella? Who, oh, not Cinderella. Um, who tries all the different beds? Goldilocks. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I spent a couple of years as, as an Associate Director at Wakatu. I uh, spent some time as an independent director on the board of Cornell and then finally settled on chief executive. So um, I can attest to it being a phenomenal organization. Uh, and just by way of background, Cornell is the food and beverage arm of Wakatu Incorporation. Uh, we are active in uh, primary industries. We're a vertically integrated business. So we are active in um, seafood, so in Kaimoana with oysters and crayfish and green shell mussels. In horticulture, we grow apples, pears, kiwi fruit, and hops. Beverages, we are tohu wines, tutu cider, and most recently, Hop Federation beer. 
and then also with Annie's fruit bars and we export predominantly uh, and we export to around 25, 35 countries around the world. So beautiful um, Maori family owned business and a, a business in which we tell a lot of stories of legacy and of our people and of our journey to this point. So it was an amazing, amazing journey over those six years. And uh, to your question about the last 18 months, I mean, I would probably define it as the most humbling experience that I've had as, a, as somebody in a leadership position. Uh, our team were deemed an essential business, so we operated through COVID. And while I think we created the platform for people to, to stand up and show up and, and be strong through that occasion, you know, you never really know how that will unfold when, when put to the test. And certainly I never would have imagined it would take place under a pandemic but they came together in a way that really blew me away that I don't think I ever could have created um, under any other condition I think that they looked after both themselves and each other in such a phenomenal way that I, I really just took a back seat you know after a first couple of weeks of organizing bits and pieces I then stood back and let them take the lead on how they best knew how to run their businesses in a safe and, and sustainable way so incredibly humbling they were nimble they were smart they were clever they were accommodating and and through all of that they they kept our head above water so that was our experience of COVID. Wow uh, thank you for that uh, very enlightening. Uh, Charlotte um, so uh, Charlotte Walsh joined as CEO of Jade Software Corporation in January 2018 uh, prior to joining Jade, she has led global businesses in health technology and packaging and print. Charlotte's an experienced company director, including current roles on the board of New Zealand Trade and Enterprise and Dodwell Centre for Quantum and Photonic Technologies. I've got no idea what that is, but I'm sure you might tell us. Uh, she's also a member of the New Zealand Institute of Directors. I'm pleased to see that Charlotte holds an MSc in physics from the University of Canterbury, although it's a shame you didn't go for economics, but hey, I'll let you away. Uh, outside of work, uh, she has three children and is an avid fan of new technologies and Jeeps. So there we go. Uh, Charlotte, uh, Jade is well-known business software, especially perhaps in the local Canterbury area, where it's somewhat associated with naming rights of the former stadium. But the business has certainly changed over time. Could you share perhaps what areas you're focusing on currently and COVID and how COVID has or has not affected your business? And maybe you'd also like to slot in there what quantum and photonic technologies are. Hello, yeah, Stephen, and, and hi to everyone else. Um, yeah, so, well, I'll, I'll go with the quantum technologies and photonics first because that's just my very happy geek place. And, um, and so, you know, I, I did, um, as you say, a physics at University of Canterbury and, and started, to, you know, got myself set up to do a doctorate. And then it's like, oh, you know what, just no, I'm, I'm never going to kind of follow this one through. But, you know, things kind of cycle around you and I get back into it. And um, so really talented group of people across New Zealand, um, University of Otago and Auckland and Canterbury and even some in Vic as well, um, working on uh, cool things to do with lasers and light and quantum technologies. It is the only board I think um, anyone could legitimately say you can sit on and you could say that we legitimately have a conversation about teleportation. It is just so cool. So um, it's kind of like, you know, I, I'm an avid Star Trek fan as well. So it's the, all my dreams come true. Um, but other than that, in terms of, in terms of um, Jade, yeah, the company's been around for 42 years. It just can, has continued to reinvent itself, you know, over and over again. And that's really one of the coolest things. And yet it's kept this core kind of spirit and culture to it the whole way through. In the last 18 months, um, our focus initially was on making sure that things were sort of solid for our people and our customers. Um, but we have a really strong recurring revenue base. So that was you know, a real privilege to kind of from our customers to carry us through in that sort of way. But in, in, since then, what we've seen is our customers have um, really taken stock of where they are and said, you know what, we have to really accelerate some of our strategic modernization projects. And so we've, we're putting a lot of energy into that at the moment. And in fact, we're um, recruiting Drive for around about 30 new people in development roles and product management roles and things like that. So exciting times. 
Um, and then aside from that, we also have a SaaS business inside the, the larger Jade, which is our anti-money laundering Jade third eye business, um, which has target markets in Australia and the UK, as well as New Zealand. And, um, and that's, that's growing at a really, in a really impressive rate. Um, we've got great, uh, our shareholders are great in terms of backing us with it, and we're pretty excited about where that's going to next as well. So quite energized, quite a lot on, um, and yeah, and, and, and good, just it's really been interesting having that global view through this in terms of, you know, how our customers are playing out there as well. Mm. Oh, right. excellent. Thank you very, very much. Na mihi nui kia koe hoki. Um, so Ben, um, and lastly to you, Ben is an accomplished leader with 28 years in manufacturing and technology businesses. Prior to moving to New Zealand, he had had 17 years with Caterpillar Incorporated developing diesel engines and powertrains for off-highway machinery and military vehicles. Now he's Managing Director at Hamilton Jet, an iconic Kiwi company with a globally respected brand in marine autojet propulsion technology. Ben is also a director at Eco Central, the council-owned recycling company in Christchurch. He's a chartered mechanical engineer and fellow of iMeGE. So, uh, Ben, uh, Hamilton Jet is a truly iconic Kiwi brand, and I'm curious to know whether they gave you a free boat or not, but um, you don't have to answer that question. Uh, <laughs> but I can imagine that given the size of our market, uh, you would be focused on um, overseas clients uh, pretty much as well. So what are the current priorities for the business and how have things changed for you guys over the last 18 months? Yeah, so th th uh, thanks, Stephen. Thanks for having uh, me on. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I'll start with a bit of an introduction just to add to that. So I'm from the UK and I've been living in New Zealand for eight years. Uh, I spent 20 years working mostly for Caterpillar, but for a bit for Ford Motor Company as well, big American corporate companies, uh, but technology companies as well. And uh, I was lured out to New Zealand, like I say, about eight years ago, I brought my family, my wife and four kids, and uh, we're living the life of Riley here now and absolutely loving it. And I came to Hamilton Jet and it felt like uh, I wasn't uh, given the leadership position straight away. Uh, the previous managing director retired a couple of years after I arrived and he was clearly looking for somebody to take over. But it felt like being given the family jewels. You know, it was like um, Hamilton. It's like everyone I met in New Zealand knew Hamilton Jet um, in one form or another. And it was an iconic Kiwi company. Everyone uses that word iconic. And, and it's probably quite well placed in this case because most people in New Zealand seem to learn about Hamilton Bill Hamilton and the story at school it's like that's most people's story when they talk to me is I learned about Bill Hamilton and what he did with jet boating when I was at school um, but what I want you to do this is kind of like telling you not to think of an elephant like you've already thought of an elephant I've just told you not to think of one I want you not to think about river boating on the Waimak or uh, on the Rakaia because Hamilton Jet today, whilst that is where we started, are a 97% export company. The 3% that is in New Zealand is mostly commercial vessels. It's not, it's a tiny portion, which is uh, water jets for, um, for pleasure craft. So we are an export company, completely export focused. To give you an idea, we've got uh, products in 63 different militaries around the world. And we make uh, everything from the smallest jet which goes into those river boats that you might be familiar with, like the shot over jet and such like. That's our smallest one. It weighs about 80 kilos. You could just about pick it up with two people comfortably to one that weighs eight tons. And there'd be four of them in a 70 meter crew boat for the oil and gas industry or in a um, military and patrol vessel. So when you think about Hamilton Jet, think about the Sumner lifeboat who go out on a Hamilton Jet vessel saving people and using the fact that there's no prop in the water safely to pick people out. Think of the Auckland police or the Wellington police who are patrolling out in their um, New Zealand designed catamaran. Um, fast ferry operators, whether you're a passenger or the operator. Uh, pilot boats, pilot boats uh, take pilots out to big container ships and drop them off on there. These are the types of products that we're putting our products into. And people like water jets because they're great at going fast, they're very efficient, they're incredibly maneuverable and they're safe in the water. Uh, including shallow water. So we've got this great product line born out of Kiwi in ingenuity. Uh, Bill Hamilton just wanted to go upstream in shallow braided rivers and then look where we've ended up. It's an absolutely fantastic story. Today we're 430 staff, we're still growing. Uh, we've got locations around the world, Singapore, the UK, Seattle. We've got employees in Brazil and Australia. Um, 
And our business model is one of distributors. So we sell this mechanical product into complex boats. It's like it's more like building a building than a car. Boats are all pretty well bespoke designed. And we sell into that market. So our customers are naval architects, boat builders, and then the people who use the boats. Um, so your question is like about what's happened in the last 18 months. Well, um, you know, what are our priorities? Well, no, number one priority is keeping people safe, right? And we've got operations overseas in places where COVID's been more rampant. And there's no doubt that making sure we're safe and in our operations is right. We're an on the road company. Salesmen are out there talking to people, building relationships all the time. So we had a year sat in at home basically. And, uh, you know, we learned to use Zoom. We probably did more customer meetings with people from New Zealand than we have ever done before because you couldn't travel. So why not bring somebody in from New Zealand into the call? It was like that was one of the revelations for us was actually now we can make this a more global thing. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's, it's definitely been safe operations here and overseas. But really, the focus has been on how do we continue to satisfy our customers by managing an operation which is subject to lockdowns level four we couldn't operate level three we could um and still focus on the strategy that we had which is all about new products about future technology about changing the business building new facilities etc so it's it's all it's been all about how to keep up with that despite what's going on oh on uh, mihi kia koe so thank you very much for that very interesting um i never did quite get out of you whether they gave you a free boat but i did say you didn't have to answer that no so they did okay no but i get to ride on them a lot <laughs> you get to ride on them a lot okay yeah, well pretty, that's pretty a bonus irregular. isn't it <laughs> yeah. okay okay so we're going to get into uh some questions um and uh, what I'll do is I'll ask each of the panelists in turn, I'll mix the panelists up a bit so that you guys get a chance to talk first and so on like that. So um, the first question I'm gonna to go to is, um, Charlotte, you'll be first for this one. What is one thing that you've learned about leadership when facing uncertainties that others may be surprised by? Particularly appropriate question in the current environment, I think. Ooh, um, I think in terms of leadership that I've been surprised by, um, well, at a, at a kind of a trivial level as a starter, um, I'm not very good at social media and, um, you know, and I, I, my team's always hitting me up to put things on LinkedIn and, you know, share things and like the rest. Not very good at that. Um, but um, with uh, what's happened over the last 18 months, we have become, as an organisation, as I suppose many have, have become much more um, connected virtually with each other. And, and that means that it's... it's I've been able to realize a kind of a dream I've had for a long time, which is to create a really transparent organization. So I don't, I don't, you know, we're not really into hierarchy and then be able to introduce these sort of levels of transparency has been fantastic. And what, what that's meant then is at a trivial level, um, as we're thinking of things, we're posting them. And then I get this terrible buzz as I get my likes coming through from, from you know, our team members. And it's, you know, it's, I feel a bit sick, but, but actually, you know, it's, it's really motivating and it's lovely seeing people connecting that way. And I think, um, uh, some of the things we've put in place just to create immediacy in leadership and immediacy um, in conversations around where we're going and how we're going and, and what people think about that or what their challenges are to that has, um, has been really, really valuable. So we've created, the organisation has changed in particular to be able to uh, for example, you know, once a week we all get together and have a, what we call a couple with a senior leadership group and there are about 220 of us in the organisation, probably um, on any given week about 100 or so join the call and lots of uh, challenges and questions and random things and fun things that come up, but like is the, is the challenges and questions that have been really useful. So recently um, the tech sector, uh, as well as many others, has been on, under a lot of sort of supply and demand pressure. And so, for example, that's impacting in terms of, um, particularly for certain skills, what the market expects in terms of salaries. And that's creating pressure and some, you know, difficult conversations in the organisation. And, you know, I think being able to have those conversations in a transparent way and have everyone involved in them um, as a leader is just, is really fulfilling, but it's also, you know, really powerful, you know, we're, we're, we're working this out together. Um, so, yeah, that's probably the, the, one of the, the biggest things recently for me. Cool. Uh, ben, what about you? What's one of the things that you've learned about leadership uh, in, a, in a time of uncertainty that uh, others or you might be surprised by? Yeah, so actually that's the, the trick in that question is that others might be surprised by because on its own, what have I learned about leadership? 
it's about communication. So like the moment that you're suddenly separated from your staff or things are going wrong or things are uncertain for a period and people are looking for clarity and they're looking to leadership to give them that. Um, it's about communication, right? But actually, uh, and I, I hadn't read the question fully when because you gave these in advance and I missed that bit until you just said it then. So what's the bit that I was surprised by? So I'll tell a story there. Um, on day one of the lockdown last year, uh, we all kind of went home and I was out walking um, my dog. I've got a, got a Hungarian visitor and he takes a lot of walking. And I saw a picture of the newspaper on, uh, on the floor because we're in a rural lifestyle block in, out, out in West Melton. And I snapped this picture of the headline on the paper that first morning of lockdown. And it says, we are now in level four. This was the press in Christchurch. And it was like a really good image. And I was like, oh, I could write something about that. So I ended up writing an article and uh, publishing it on Microsoft Teams on our website where we created an employee page and on our Facebook page. And I ended up doing one of those every day. So I ended up doing 49 daily articles uh, about something. It was like people want some connection. They want to read something, they want to hear something. So what I started is almost like, uh, oh, that would be a good idea. Ended up being this thing where I did it 49 days in a row. And some days it was like a grind and some days it was a real pleasure to write. And then when we went back into lockdown recently, I started up again. So it was kind of level four and level three, I was doing it. The thing that surprised me is how that connected me to the people in a way that I wouldn't have got if I was in the office because you're too busy, right? So what happens is you post something on Facebook or on Teams and people comment and they respond and you get to respond to them. And then next time you see them, you're in the office and it's like, hey, I really appreciated what you said about that. That was good. Or I was really intrigued by that. And you end up in a conversation. So what surprised me is the way that this kind of chronic situation suddenly sparked new ways to connect with people that formed bonds. And that's the thing, right? Because you'd imagine separating people will break bonds, but it's finding the opportunities to form them. That's the, the And I fell into it. It was like, it wasn't any kind of, you know, mm. sudden uh, reaction. It was just like, I'll do this for a bit and see how it goes. You know? It's amazing how those things can be organic, isn't it? Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Very nice. Uh, Rachel, what about you? Well, I'll just, um, just sort of riffing off Ben's, I think communication is one of those things that I was, um, well, invested in before we went in, but also found new ways to undertake while we were in uh, COVID. And I think, uh, you know, if I think about our workforce, uh, the majority of the workforce within Cornwall, we've got about 500 people, I would say 400 of them work in a factory or on an orchard. And so they're not desk jockeys, they're not sitting waiting for my latest, greatest email missive. Um, however, they are connected on social media. And so uh, I guess not unlike Ben, I started um, through COVID running a couple of live streams at different times to allow for different shifts to be working. Um, and also a Zoom call, which anyone could join so that they could have a face and that they could have a, you know, that over the water cooler style engagement. And that was a really valuable way of just being available. And the live stream is very disconcerting because you're basically talking to yourself for however long you can stand it, which for me was not very long. And people would dial in and, you know, provide comments and have an interaction, but also in a very safe way for them because, you know, not, not everyone loves fronting up to the CEO no matter how personable you might be. And so to do it in a, in a, in a way that, um, and particularly when they're feeling vulnerable, so to, to do it in a way that's new and interesting and, and that they might be used to was something that we jumped on fairly quickly, which was great. So I really enjoyed that experience of communicating with them in a different way. But I would say one of my biggest learnings was that in leadership is that as the leader of any team or organization or project, one of the things you have to make um, very, very sure of is that you're looking after yourself um, so that you can then extend that out to others because there is just no point at all in you as the leader tipping over because you're working too hard and too fast and too long um, because you're just serving, you're not serving your purpose at all, which is really to serve your people. That is my, I guess, my MO on leadership is in and around servant leadership. And if you're not at full capacity, um, physically and mentally and, and by any other definition, then you certainly can't discharge, discharge your duties as that carer or as that leader. So, so I found out a lot about myself in the process and then tried to find ways to make sure that all four wheels are always on the track. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to just do a little in-between question exercise with our panellists. Now, I've warned them what this is, 
Uh, it's a little game called underrated or overrated. And the rules of this game are I get to put a, uh, a thing to them and they get one word answer, which is overrated or underrated. And they're not allowed to justify that answer. That's the only thing that those are the rules because it's my game, right? Uh, so uh, we'll go in the same order as we, as we just did. Um, so Charlotte, Ben, and then Rachel. And the thing is, uh, so uh, social media, as an advertising channel. Do you think it's overrated or underrated? Social media as an advertising channel. Charlotte. Mm, overrated. All right, uh, Ben. Underrated. Underrated, <laughs> Rachel. Underrated. Underrated, okay. So there's a two to one underrated social media as an advertising channel. Mind you, Charlotte, you did give the game away when you said you weren't really kind of on that social media thing. So, you know, but there we go. Okay, nice. Thank you very much. Um, right. Uh, so when we're facing challenges uh, such as COVID, climate change, uh, social movements, different government policy, whatever the challenge is, what in your view does good governance look like? How do boards and management teams best work together as we face the challenges of the future? Rachel, I'm going to come to you first on this one. Yep, and it's and it's a great question. I think that in trying times, you have to look at to the glue that that pulls you together, so you can, I guess, essentially paddle your waka in the same uh, the same pace and with the same effort and and hopefully in the same direction. And that for me, that always comes down to the values of an organisation and and ensuring that everywhere from from orchard, from factory, for, through to frontline administrators, um, your sales team, your senior management, and your board are crystallized around what are very clear and meaningful values. And I know that a lot of the time values are often words on a page, which are then flung into a very pretty poster, which appears on people's walls. Um, but, but those are the ones that obviously, well, not obviously, but those are the ones that invariably don't stick. But I think that if you have a values led behavior in the organization, if you are able to be demonstrable about that and use them as the wayfinders, the very hard decisions become very easy almost instantly. And I think that people use them, as I say, as wayfinders to help them, you know, in the smallest occasions on the daily basis through to the biggest decisions you might have as an organization. So that's that's what my expectation is to try and conditions is, is to really draw on those agreed values. Nice, thank you. Um, Charlotte. Yeah, look, I'd absolutely um, pick that one up as well. Um, that values alignment is, is so key. Uh, I think one of the things that we've learnt um, during the last 18 months is we've done a lot of work on our values alignment within the organisation, but then we realised that actually it was one of the board members who said, actually, you know, we're not necessarily aligned with the company's values. So, let's, so we did some workshopping on that, and that, that's been super helpful, um, I think, just to make sure that we're all... We're all you know, joined up uh, kind of spiritually, if you like, as we're, as we're you know, heading on our mission together. Um, the other thing I'd say um, that boards, um, you know, in terms of really adding value at times like this is also sharing. So we're not reinventing. And, you know, they we have, um, well, boards I've been on, boards I have, um, the, the, you know, the really good ones are the ones where the directors are, are there, you know, bringing their ideas and their experiences and able to share them. So, you know, we've got a difficult situation coming up, particularly something like, like the COVID situation, but, you know, other ones as well, um, being able to uh, share their resources and experiences and make and, and connections um, makes a, a heck of a difference in terms of lifting the bar, you know. Nice, thank you. Uh, ben? Very good. Well, I like Charlotte's answer and, and uh, Rachel, I like yours in particular because you talked about values in a positive way. I, values can be this thing that become trite. You like write them on the wall and then, they, and then they don't mean anything. But using them as a compass is what they're for. And I really like that. Um, so for me, there's um, the thing I've kind of learned both as a, a director for Hamilton Jet, a director for Eco Central and understanding the difference between being a director and a, and a CEO has been a really interesting journey for me as well. Um, but there's a thing in governance and politics called the Overton window, which is the window of acceptable conversation and acceptable debate and acceptable policy making. And if you take something like climate change, which is in your question, um, you know, you go back even five years and boards weren't talking very much about it. So that, you know, governance was this, uh, governance is this thing where you focus on the important issues of the day and 
uh, you've got two responsibilities, which is today and the future. And they're you know very clear. Today is about watching the numbers and making sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. And then the future is about where's the company going. And the thing about the Overton window is it shifts quite suddenly sometimes. You know, nobody would have actually given you much time if you talked about pandemics two years ago. You probably wouldn't have, have had a very long conversation about it. But now you'll get plenty of air time, right? The climate change is the same. It's like five, even five years ago, it's not that long, but that was when I started being on boards. It wasn't a great topic, but now there are boards worrying about whether they could be prosecuted like cigarette companies for failing to act on climate change. You know, the way the cigarette companies did with the health issue. It's like that, all of a sudden it's like, now you've got our attention, so we're gonna talk about it and we're gonna do things. And it's the inflection point for climate change for me is the moment where governments and businesses get really serious about it and it's not just a social movement. So interesting, because social movements tend to be what move the Overton window often. But um, for me, the point is that as a leader in those boardrooms, it's to be, to be courageous enough to be a leader in those debates, be the first to raise it. It's like, um, uh, I work, you mentioned at the beginning, I work for Eco Central, the recycler in uh, New Zealand, uh, in Christchurch. And it's not um, news to anybody that we offshore some of our recycling, but we're getting really serious about who we're offshoring it with and what their policies are and what their plants are like and are they looking after those people and have they got acceptable work conditions and are they following good environmental practices? Those, those things people weren't worried about 10 years ago. It genuinely wasn't a thing. So it's about, you know, I use that example because that's something that I've kind of pushed a little bit in, in the Eco Central board. Um, I think it's an opportunity. If you're in governance, there's this opportunity to take the lead on something and watch for when that Overton window shifts and it suddenly comes into view. Nice. Thank you very, very much. Um, there's there's um, the odd question popping into the question answers. I'll I'll just park those for a little bit. We will have time for Q and A uh, at the end. Um, so rest assured that if you put a question, uh, if the participants put a question in there, uh, it's it's not being ignored. So all right. So underrated, overrated. All right. Um, so this time we'll go we'll go in the same order, which is uh, Rachel, Charlotte, and Ben. Underrated or overrated? A university education. I feel Rachel. like a, the company I'm in. <laughs> um, underrated. Underrated. Yeah. Charlotte. Yeah, underrated. Uh, ben? Ooh. <laughs> oh, overrated. <laughs> overrated. Now I work in a university and oh, I won't tell you what my answer is. Okay. Uh, uh, question four here for this on our run sheet. So um, markets within Asia have become increasingly important to New Zealand businesses. How does this apply to your business? And what should New Zealand businesses keep in mind when seeking to grow? in Asia. So Ben, I'm going to come to you first for this one. Okay. Um, so to, uh, the profile of our business is we're reasonably distributed between Asia, Europe, Africa, and Middle East, which is sort of the next third of the globe, and then the Americas. Um, but more and more recently, the Asia Pacific region has been the dominant region in our um, you know, uh, uh, revenue. And uh, it comes from um, South Korea, it comes from Japan, it comes from China, um, the Philippines, uh, Indonesia, Taiwan, um, you know, the, the list is becoming endless, to be honest. India is a huge market for us. And um, the thing about Asia as a culture is it is as a, as a and that's a terrible generalization. But the point is that all Asian cultures are very different to ours. So in terms of winning in Asia, one of the things that's really important if you take a product like ours, which is a really technical uh, business, we're selling something that takes a lot of engineering to get it into its final resting place in a boat. Um, relationships and communication are absolutely key. So one of the most important things for us is the bridge people. So the people who form this bridge between the nation or the culture that you're selling into and the business that we are, which is a Kiwi business, mostly stuffed with Westerners, okay? Not entirely, we're actually quite diverse in that regard, but my, you know, that tends to be the, the sort of uh, persona of the business. So, you know, and there's two key types of those individuals. Uh, they are Asians who are really conversant in the Western world, and they're Westerners who are very conversant in the Asian world. So for example, our sales and marketing manager 
uh, has lived in Papua New Guinea, lived in uh, Singapore for most of his life. He grew up in Japan, but he's a Kiwi, right? So he's like this perfect golden egg that we found that's got this great um, relationship with uh, people in Asia. He knows how to build relationships and he's lived there most of his life. And equally, there are people the other way around. One of his sales managers, a guy called Anil, I would put in the other category. He is very much somebody who can absolutely interface with the team in New Zealand. He can talk to them and he can influence them and he can make them work on his behalf. So that's the thing is like, what's your bridge between the two? Because you can't walk in to a country like China as a Westerner and do good business in that uh, in that location, it just doesn't quite work like that. We've we've got a distribution middle uh, a business model, so we have a Chinese distributor, Indonesian distributor. Those guys are really important too, but you want these critical people, these bridge people, in your own control. Nice, thank you, um, Rachel. I mean, I think Ben is, um, he's nailed it that, that relationships are key and, and China is one of uh, Cornell's biggest markets and we have an office in Shanghai, which is amazing. I think, but it, but but equally, I would say Southeast Asia is, is our largest region that we would work into outside of China. So for me, in my experience, where I've had the greatest success is spending an inordinate amount of time listening and understanding the people that you're working with and having um, taking the time to understand that so you can respect for me, more than anything, there's social structures because that tends to dictate how they then show up in a in a professional sense. So, uh, and I guess, you know, I was the beneficiary, if you will, of a chairman who has been going to China f for 30 years. You know, he this was not new for him. And so I would roll him out at our trade shows and, you know, with, with great effect because he had the mana that people did recognize and respect and in the relationships that he has created and stuck with for for 30 years and so I think that oftentimes China is such a huge market and it is incredibly complex and challenging to work with and that becomes daunting for companies uh, we don't wouldn't have a show of pulling out of China for, for one because it's an incredible market to be in but because he and uh, the rest of the board and now by association the company recognize what a very long-term investment a, a market of that magnitude might be. So I think um, sticking with it is certainly something that you can't underestimate. Nice, thank you. Um, Charlotte, to you. Yeah, um, well, we don't have, um, Asia is not a target market for us, so we don't have anything there with Jade Software. But from previous experience, um, I think a couple of things to come to mind is one, um, Asia is like saying, you know, all of Europe, right? It's it's really different. There are so many different cultures. And I think to Rachel's point, you know, understanding the difference, the social structures of each of those different cultures and the way they work is really important. I remember talking with um, one of my uh, teammates in China and and uh, and actually he was, um, he was a guy working on a, in our factory. And he said, you know, it's really interesting working for a New Zealand company because it works like this. But if I work for a Taiwanese company, it feels like this. And if I work for a, a, um, a Thai company, it feels like this. And, you know, running through such different, you know, Japanese company, they work this way. So such different experiences for your people and for your customers and, you know, in so many different ways. So I think it's really important to recognize those differences and, and really just sort of lean into them, if you like, um, and be clear about, you know exactly where are you you know really targeted about where where and who are you actually selling to um and then i love the on the ground piece as well um per um, ben's comment um, i couldn't go through this without making a really strong plug for nzte here so if i was about to um, take my um, jade software into anywhere in asia right now i would be absolutely buddying up with nzte they've got they can help with the connections and understanding the regulatory environment doing um making some wonderful customer connections and like uh it, it, in previous pre-COVID times, certainly, certainly assisting with some really wonderful deep customer insight work, really understanding customers in their homes and how they how they live and work, um, and um, uh, so you can actually validate the piece of the market that you really can excel in, and uh, and that you know they're there standing beside you, helping you on that journey. So, uh, yeah, that would be the other key thing for me. Mm. Nice, some nice common themes coming through there, isn't there, about um, uh, recognition of uh, differences and building the bridge with the right people between those uh, differences. 
Very nice. Um, okay, so underrated, overrated, all right. Um, underrated or overrated? Uh, in business, the ability to speak a second language. Overrated or underrated? Ben? Underrated. Underrated? Rachel? Underrated. Underrated. Charlotte? Totally underrated. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that might be good. the most. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excellent. I thought that might be the most patsy question that I actually gave you, but you know, <laughs> there it is. Yeah. No. Okay, cool. So, yeah, there's a well known Fokotoki uh, in New Zealand that most people will know. What is the most important thing in the world? It is people, it is people, it is people. And so, in the next 18 months, as uh, we hopefully emerge out of our current pandemic settings, uh, what would you recommend that business leaders should do to support their own people and also perhaps more broadly, uh, wider society. So Charlotte, I'm going to come to you first on this one. Sure. Um, yeah, I think um, for me, it, whether, I'm, whether it's uh, our own people or our customers or, or wider society, I think for me, one of the starting points is, you know, is empathy and curiosity. And, um, and so as a leader, I think that's, in, you know, for a leadership team, I think it's very much about just taking the time to, to listen. Um, that's a big part, that's kind of a starting point. But beyond that, um, really helping people to feel able to challenge, challenge their own paradigms as well as the organization's paradigms or, or the, the maybe the situation they're in um, in, a, in a broader sense. So, so um, yeah, I, I think that, that uh, the, the listening and the challenge is quite important. And, and what I think with the, with the empathy piece and challenges, uh, it can be easy to get drawn into Thinking, well, I've listened to all these people and I've, you know, I've given the challenges, and so now I should just go and do, I should go and do exactly what I've heard. That's not necessarily the case. The kind of empathy is about boundaries as well. And so it's about making sure that you've heard and dug sort of this is where the curiosity piece comes in and dug deeper to understand what's underneath that. So what sometimes, you know, what people say with their customers, your own people, what they say that they need or want, this doesn't necessarily come from a place of of like a sort of a deeper understanding. I think our role as leaders is to help drive those deeper conversations to understand what's really underneath it. So we really can so co-create um, a future together. And, and so, yeah, so I, that, that to me is kind of a key thing going forward. Mm, nice. Uh, Rachel. Uh, I think for the, for our, what, what, what was previously my team, um, what was really important is to keep knowing them. I think in the last 18 months, we worked, well, we unearthed, um, more about our team than, than we had ever before and, and through necessity, but you know, there were questions of who's a vulnerable employee and or is there anyone in their house who was in that situation and the amount of information that they trusted us with uh, was phenomenal. And it fundamentally changed the way we thought about how we care for our, our workforce. So I think keeping in that vein and now it's not um, the same questions. Now it's more in and around, for instance, vaccinations, who is, who isn't, you know, how might that fall out? Um, so I think knowing more and more about your team enables you to be a much better leader and or employer for the, for your people. I think uh, remaining flexible in the light of what you do unearth. I mean, there is just no universality to your employees. They're all incredibly different. And there, whilst there is a sameness, there is as much difference as there is commonality. So I think in that respect, you have to work out very quickly how to corral a team when... Uh, labor is in demand and you know you've already heard um, Charlotte and Ben talk about you know the, or Charlotte in particular talking about what you're looking for and, and on the board of the warehouse I know that we are also looking just for a huge number of people in the in the same space so there's great competition on for staff and so I think what we really need to think about as, in, as leaders and employers is why us why would they choose us because gone are the days of us having you know 50 CVs arrive and you know you get to wave your wand over who you wish to join your team I quite literally feel interviewed by people who arrive now you know will I come to you and so you have to put your best foot forward what is my work for future workforce plan how will I upskill and motivate the people who will come to me knowing that that's a very rapidly changing environment so how do I keep up and how do I ensure that they feel like they're footing it in the same time so I think you have to work much much harder um, on a number of levels, not least of which, is, as I said, is, is really understanding people in their context. 
Nice. Thank you. Uh, ben. Yeah, thanks. A great answer is both um, Rachel and Charlotte. That's good. Um, I actually wondered if everyone would have the same theme on this question. So I'd written down mental health. And uh, I guess there's flavours of that running through uh, both of the answers prior to me. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the last 18 months have been a challenging place and they've been a challenging place. One of the things I think is it's been a leveller. Uh, you know, um, people like us on the call, uh, you know, I'm sure Charlotte and Rachel, your lives have just been turned upside down. And at times it's felt like your workload has doubled and, um, you know, the, the job of trying to hold things together is almost insurmountable. But actually at the very other end of the scale, You've got people who are doing a lot of the hard work in the business and they don't know how to handle being at home and not having something to do. Um, and the people in the middle who feel like this obligation to keep working and working hard and they feel they struggle because their effectiveness isn't as high as it was before. And that's just the work perspective. And then you've got all this other stuff going on around them, like the fact that you've got four people trying to work out of the same room all on different Zoom calls or um, people haven't got a space to go. They actually haven't got somewhere to go and sit um, in order to do their work. You know, this has been one of the most straining times. And if I go back to my comment about the Overton window, one of the nice things about our modern world today is that mental health has shifted properly into that focus. It's like it's now an acceptable conversation and it's definitely an acceptable conversation at leadership levels. And our job as leaders is to make it an, not just an acceptable conversation within our teams, but something that they actually are, and this will happen in the future, it's not now, but they are instinctively going to talk about. It's not something that you feel instinctively you have to uh, keep behind closed doors. And that might take a generation, but you know, I watch the millennials and the Gen Zers coming through in our business and they are much more uh, conversant in those kind of topics. So to me, what could you know the question is what can we do to support our people it's to continue that conversation in a way of making it acceptable and i'll tell you what it is not comfortable right now it feels awkward it feels like not everybody wants to have these conversations but we're on this journey of taking it from unacceptable conversation to totally acceptable so it's our job to push that forward mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, there's, there's a whole strand of literature about how work is not just simply a source of income, but a source of meaning uh, for people. And that's a very important thing that I think we're starting to recognise. Charlotte, I wonder if I could just pick up on something that you mentioned. And I wonder if it, perhaps we'll just go around in the same order for a little brief comment. You mentioned um, about, um, about uh, you know, people in the organisation challenging their paradigms and being willing to, you know, to, to, to basically speak. Um, uh, you know, there are some powerful forces pushing back against people saying unpopular things. Um, how do you create um, safe spaces for and the environment for people to be able to uh, be confident that they can that they can say something which they're not sure how it's going to be received? Um, I, you know, I think I think everything comes well. And this is this is like motherhood and apple pie in a way, but it comes back to leaders setting the setting the environment and context. And it comes back to what we we're talking about before in terms of values aren't just things on the wall. It's all about behaviors and how you model them and how you how you um, break down barriers with them. And uh, and, and so I think um, you know, for us anyway, um, you know, a lot of that, we've had some really interesting conversations, at ones that are, people have really struggled with, for example, around um, what do we do with pronouns? Um, uh, we had some interesting behaviors around Pride Week, um, some really good stuff, some really crazy stuff. Um, there are a number of other things that have come up. Um, we have like quite a cross uh, multi generational sort of workforce. And so, you know, some quite different points of views and ways of doing things. And I think um, uh, what we've seen is that um, leaders being open and honest and also being clear about, you know, not knowing everything and but living the values and, and, um, speaking in respectful ways, you know, understanding that everyone has different points of view, but not bringing, we, we sort of, we, we came up with a, we, we came up with a thing around saying, look, you know, you can have all the, all your sort of other views, if you like, outside of work, but we want you to leave those at the door. When you come in the door, it's about like being really respectful of each other and, and being, you know, um, open to hearing what others do. It doesn't mean you have to buy into it, but like hearing and understanding and being curious and, you know, that only gets role modeled by the leaders doing that to start with. So. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Rachel. 
think Charlotte, you're probably much kinder than me in that, in that I, I, <laughs> I just, if they've got them, they can have them. <laughs> For me, you know, like I'm very much of the mind that you know, there are, there's lots of waka on the road and this is what ours looks like. And uh, we invite you on it and you'll have a great time and it'll be very fulfilling and we will care for you and love you. Um, but your personal values need to align with ours as an organization because I'm very strongly of the view that where they don't, eventually the rub will become too great and you will probably self vote yourself off the island, really. Um, because it just becomes too difficult, I think, to maintain, you know, from nine to five, this this view of yourself and then um, outside of that something else. So, you know, it's, it's interesting in that respect. And the first time I said that to the team, I think they're like, what? <laughs> we have to get off, am I? basically. Um, however, that said, I think to create that environment where people can feel comfortable in having a challenge, because I'm not suggesting at all that we should all be sort of children of the corn-esque thinking and moving in the same way. It's just more, um, if there are profoundly conflicting views over, you know, a Pride Week or, you know, those sorts of quite defining positions, that becomes challenging. But I think as the conversations go, for me, um, it's really, I think, appreciating that not everyone will treat the situation the way you might, the way I might. And so I'm generally kind of a straight up the middle person and very happy to have those conversations, but that doesn't uh, work for everyone. So I think I've learned from a really good friend of mine, Karenza, who's the CEO of Wakatu Incorporation, how to leave space for people. Um, and she does it to me all the time. And I tended to fill it with sort of quite random nonsense for the beginning part until I worked out what was actually happening. Um, then I became much smarter with the wide open spaces, but I also then in turn left wide open spaces for others because it is a very valuable way of inviting perhaps more introverted or more um, hesitant people to, to join a room and to join a conversation. Uh, which doesn't include running straight into the middle of a room and waving your arms around. So just different ways, different strokes, I think. Nice, thank you. And uh, Ben? Yeah, so um, it's almost too long since the question was asked for me to remember exactly what it was. <laughs> How do you create gonna... that? How do you create that environment for people to be confident to come forward with things yeah, that they're so, not sure how they'll be received? So exactly. So so I think my answer there is, so that how do you create it? I guess the, the first thing is it is important you create it. You have to create an environment where people speak their mind. Um, and it is, it, it is hard. And I would say that I joined an organization eight years ago where that wasn't the case. And part of my role has been to try and open up a conversation where conversation was previously uh, just not listen to you know kind of with uh, other people had better ideas right um something that has been really interesting on that journey though is uh take a few topics so sustainability be, would be one diversity equity and inclusion would be another. um both areas that nobody would deny you should be doing something on that they are um you know trends within the world they're driving forces in the world that are going to change our future and uh, most businesses, like, you know, even, even more so most governments, they kind of trail in the wake of them, right? That society moves faster than business, which moves faster than government. Um, the thing I found is that uh, the moment you try and do anything in those spaces, you meet resistance. And it was surprising to me what the nature of that resistance was, because I imagined when people said they met resistance, it would be people not thinking we should care for the environment, or people thinking that we shouldn't be more diverse, that we're diverse enough and that we're inclusive enough. What I've actually found is a group in my business of people who are absolutely as passionate as I am about moving the needle on sustainability and DEI, yet they just think you're doing it wrong. And it's like, it's like I think you're right on message, but I wouldn't be doing that. And have you thought of this angle? And, have you, and the toughest thing for me as a leader has been to listen to that and assimilate it and do something with it because that's the job right you, you need to listen to it you have to accept but also to not use that as a reason to not do anything because it would be really easy to look at the range of feedback i'll take the range of feedback i've had on dei and it is everything from we should do way more than we're doing to we should stop doing what we're doing and it's like okay so the balance is somewhere in the middle and it's my job to at least try and be forceful and determined on that path so yeah it kind of Stick to, stick to your guns, but listen to the feedback and make sure that people feel that they can say it. Because at least in my case, I'm getting the feedback. 
That's a that's a really interesting point. Um, I, it, it, as an economist, and lots of people don't like economists, um, I run into this all the time where I end up disagreeing with people, but we almost always agree about the objective. We all yeah. want to make the world a better yeah. place in this way, that way, the other way. What we end up um, confronting about is often the method by which we get there. So yeah, yeah nice, very yeah. nice point. Okay, um, all right. Uh, Overrated or underrated? Time for that again. So this one, um, I'll come to the same. Uh, that, so it'll be Charlotte, uh, Rachel, then Ben. Same order. Uh, overrated or underrated? The influence that the board has on the success of an organisation. The influence the board has on the success of an organisation. Charlotte, overrated or underrated? Underrated. Underrated. Rachel. Overrated. Overrated. Ben? Underrated. Casting vote. Underrated. underrated. <laughs> okay. If they're right. letting me struck down with lightning, so I'm going to bolt with <laughs> IOD lightning. I, I, I told you, you don't, it's, it's my rules, my game. You don't get an opportunity to justify it to the people who are out there. I'm sorry. I'm not. <laughs> it's fine. I haven't got a board now. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they love you. It's fine. So, Okay. Um, right, so um, what I am going to do is, um, I, I, for the panellists here, I, you'll know, you'll see I'm just um, skipping over a, a, a wee question here. So um, so this is on your run sheets question. Eight. As, um, so um, as we perhaps face an extended period of uh, COVID disruption, if you could advocate to the New Zealand government on behalf of your business, uh, what would you ask for? So what would you ask for if you could advocate to the New Zealand government on behalf of your business? So Rachel, I'm going to come to you first. Uh, I would advocate for um, more speedy, more, more, more speedy, smarter, more easily understood and accessible MIQ allowances. Um, but but by, but what, by whatever model, but by a model which allows us to move as the rest of the world is starting to in a, in a safe and controlled way. Mm. Okay. Uh, all right. Nice. Yep. Anything you want to add to that? Is that, no. that your entirety? I think, that, your I think the participants um, will probably wholly appreciate the necessity. I mean, we've all been on an even playing field uh, without being able to move for the last 18 months, but, uh, and certainly I would never second guess our strategy of keeping our people safe. So that's, this is certainly not a comment on that. No. It's more uh, that as the world moves, so too do we. And I really appreciated Ian Taylor's article in the weekend around, um, you know, bringing the bench on because we've got some phenomenally smart people in the country who I think could lend their uh, great minds to, to new and exciting solutions. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, uh, ben. So I'm very, I'm going to pick your question apart. You did not say the one thing. So I've got seven. <laughs> um, I'm going to go through them real quick. I'm going to go through no, them did, real quick. <laughs> That's good because I, yeah. I did promise you I'd be referee if you weren't careful. Yeah. So go so, on. Number one is allow businesses that support essential services overseas to operate under level four. We're one of those 80% of our businesses overseas. We're not allowed to operate at level four, but it's 80% of essential services overseas. We're building a bad reputation. Number two is lockdowns really, really hurt businesses. And they need to find a way as we move forward. It's sooner rather than later, please, to change the way that we manage lockdown so that businesses can continue to operate safely. Um, find ways to help us. They did that during uh, the last lockdown with air transport. So they put on planes, MZTE chartered planes, so they could keep air transport moving. I'd love them to do that with container uh, freighting because we've got a major problem with container ships cancelling routes down to in New Zealand because it's unprofitable. Um, immigration. Uh, the new cap on salary, you have to pay someone to bring them in, completely excludes pe people with trade skills like qualified CNC machinists and such like, really skilled professions you just can't find in New Zealand. Invest in training in New Zealand, so important that we build our own strength, otherwise we're going to be back to immigration again. Um, new Zealand trade and enterprise, give them loads of money because they're awesome, I completely agree with that sentiment before. They do an enormous amount of work if you engage with them. You have to engage with them, but then it's free and it's brilliant. Um, and my last point, I've written overseas and I can't remember what that meant, so I'm going to leave that one. I'll give you six. <laughs> I'll shut up. Okay. The six is, six, is, uh, six, is, uh, six is fine. Six is a good number. All right. Uh, Charlotte. 
Yeah, mine's probably in the same space as as, as the other two, particularly um, Rachel's, in that, I mean, like, there's a piece that we have to all be doing ourselves, right, which is the staying safe, and I think also, you know, getting vaccinations and those sorts of things, doing our bit to be able to uh, achieve the strategy that enables the borders to be opened as fast as possible. And so I, I, you know, MIQ and those sort of things, yeah, but I just want the borders open so that we, you know, we have a way of traveling. I'd love to have the definition of what does travel look like? So we're like, cool, there's the goal. What else do I need to do to make sure that, you know, that I'm doing everything I can to get to that, you know, to help move my people and, and you know, my, my community towards that the fastest. Mm, nice. I'll tell you what, this question has um, exercised the participants about the, the chat, the, the chat box started to light up and, and it hasn't run for previous questions. So what I'm actually going to do here is there is a question sitting in the question and answer section, which I think the panelists should have seen, and it's it's actually relevant here. So we're just going to pop it in. So the question um, uh, says, I'm keen to understand how you are engaging with your offshore customers, how you are opening new markets and how you are navigating MIQ. So um, we'll, as, a, as it's a tack on question, I'll go in the same order again. So uh, Rachel. Uh, well, we're not navigating MIQ. So I'll start from the um, end and, and work back that way. Opening new markets. We, uh, we brought on a, some new staff who have experience in, in, in new markets. So in seafood, we, we brought on a really amazing new staff member or team member who has experience in uh, Cuba and Russia and markets that we've never explored before, which she has great experience in, in the seafood world. So that, that's been really useful. And how are we engaging with them? I mean, nothing earth shattering, but phone calls, video calls, uh, using people on the ground. And to, to Charlotte's point about NZTE, they have become our boots on the ground. And, and oftentimes they also cannot get out to the market, but, but, but with time and with familiarity and with language barriers, I think to be able to utilize uh, those services, uh, and, it, and it is a public service, if they can, if people can utilize those amazing people in the markets, then that's a really, um, a really great way to stay in touch while you can't be there. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, ben, how are you uh, doing so this? The, yeah, so the, the question's really about how we're developing markets, right? So, I mean, our traditional markets, they're, they're generally served by distributors in country and our regional offices in territory which uh, have been reasonably uh, operational. They, the regional offices didn't travel for 12 months, but um, you know, Singapore, the UK and the US are all back to traveling now. They've got past this in, in a way that we haven't, they've just got accepting of it. So we um, haven't done anything novel there. What we did do that I think was fortunate timing, I won't just call it a stroke of genius, it was fortunate timing is just around about the um, pandemic last year, we're about to launch a new product and it was a hybrid marine drive. So it's essentially a diesel electric drive for boats, big commercial boats. And that gave us this opportunity to continue conversations with boatyards who were suddenly interested in it that we couldn't go and visit. And they would take a Zoom call to talk about that, whereas they might not have just taken a Zoom call to talk about the status quo and how business was going. And it gave me an opportunity as CEO and some of my team in New Zealand to join those calls as well. So it suddenly became, felt like this kind of global approach towards uh, selling our products so that that has uh, has probably been the, the the best thing we did I think um, there was a part in the question that was about MIQ I mean to be honest MIQ just means you can't travel uh, you know it's not it's not an option like you're going to send your team overseas do whatever isolation they need to do there and then come home and do two weeks in isolation here it actually just says you know, and and by the way you can't book a slot for the next four months it's, it's completely, it's just meant no travel. They might as well just called it no travel. Cool. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, now for that, the, we've reached about the time of the audience Q&A. And so if there are people who would like to put questions in there into the Q&A, do that and we'll come to those next. I do have another question in case uh, there are no, uh, no um, audience Q&A, but I've got um, one more underrated, overrated for you, right? One more un underrated uh, and overrated. Uh, and this one is the school that you went to, underrated or overrated? So, uh, Rachel. Underrated. Underrated, all right, Ben. Oh, underrated, but nobody would know where it was. So. Ah, da, da. No, no <laughs> not the school. I, actually, I should have asked it. So I should have asked this question slightly differently. Um, I suspect you're um, you're interpreting this as the school that you went to. Right. Okay, yeah. we'll interpret that. Okay, so we'll go that way. The school that you went to. Um, yeah, 
Underrated, Charlotte? Underrated. Underrated, okay, all right. Uh, what about the school that you go to in general? So how do people, you know, so like the school that you've gone to, right? So not just you specifically, but you know, how does society see it? Uh, do you think that the school that you go to is overrated or underrated, Rachel? Underrated? Underrated, all right, Ben? Yeah, I'll go underrated again. Okay, and Charlotte? Do you mean, sorry, can I just clarify the question? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I just said underrated. I was like, I don't know. It's next. Yeah, I'm going overrated. Overrated. Okay, overrated. All right. So, yeah. well, those of you who said um, underrated, you'll have just made all the people in the audience who are paying private school fees very happy. Okay. So, <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Uh, so, um, all right. I will come. If, if so, for, for the people in who are uh, the attendees, if you have a question, pop it in there now. Um, there aren't any sitting there in the queue, so I will ask you uh, one more. Um, so there may well be people sitting in, uh, in, in our attendees list who aspire to the sort of role that each of you have in the coming years. So uh, maybe they're even looking to take on your job. Um, in your view, what will be the requirements of a great CEO in a decade's time? So looking forward, always, you know, prediction is always tricky, especially when it's about the future. But um, I want you to look forward and say, what will the requirements of a great CEO be in a decade's time? Uh, so, Ben, I'm going to come to you first. Mm. Now, this is a tricky one, actually. I think that so where I am at the moment is uh, strategic foresight is a really important thing to be conversant in. And it's not something you just have, it's something you actually have to practice. And strategic foresight is the ability to look at the future in a way that allows you to illuminate what you might do today. And uh, we sit at this point where change has been accelerating over the last few decades. And there's a thing said that if you, know, if you look in future studies, like the change you might see in the next 20 years is equivalent to the change you've seen in the last 40 years. It's like double it, right? So um, I sit here thinking right now that my job uh, in the company is to make sure that we have foresight of what's gonna happen in the future and are doing something about it today in a tangible way, not just talking about what might happen, but actually tr trying to uh, mitigate and, and uh, protect. Now, you wind forward to 10 years, it's just gonna be that times two. So uh, that's, that's kind of my answer is it, people who have got a great ability to s not see the future, but talk com conversantly about the possible futures. Cool, right. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> boy, that's, that's going to be a, uh, a, a rare and valuable skill, I suspect, doesn't it? So um, Charlotte. Uh, I really love that, um, so that strategic foresight piece. I think that's great. I think um, what I'd add, add to that was, would be, uh, someone with an infinite game kind of a mindset. So, you know, that like a multi-generational sort of a mindset to things. Um, and I think coupled with that uh, transparency, low ego, and a truckload of ambition for their company and for New Zealand. Nice. And uh, Rachel? That's funny. A couple of, definitely a couple of repeats in there. So I had that you will um, need to be a futurist. So that's um, most certainly in the in the um, in Ben's lane. That uh, relentless ambition was one that I had as well as, as Charlotte did. You know, invincible optimism. I love the idea of invincible, uh, being invincibly optimistic. Um, no ego. I think you need to love people. I think it's it's challenging to be a really strong CEO if you just just sort of generally don't like or or love people. I think that. Um, you, knowing how to build a global workforce, because I think that um, we'll need to really think carefully about where we place our people. And I think you're not going to be able to be an effective CEO unless you can embrace the digital world. I think it's just going to be an impossibility to, to be wholly effective um, in, a, in a true position of leadership without that. Mm, yeah. Thanks. Look, we've had, a, and we've had a couple of questions come in. I, um, 
so our panelists can probably see those. So we'll go to uh, the first one. So the first question, so we'll keep these answers uh, reasonably brief, if that's okay, um, just so that we can uh, make, if in case there's a couple more come in. So how do we make the most of a crisis or how to make the most of a crisis to achieve positive change and paradigm shifts as against the inertia of the status quo systems and expectations? For example, the Canterbury earthquakes and the city being built back in the same places uh, and modes. So uh, Rachel, I'll come to you first on that one. Yep, great. So I am um, with the APEC Business Advisory Council. We have um, three members as representatives of New Zealand. One of them is Malcolm Johns, who's CEO of Christchurch Airport. Phenomenal individual. If you ever had the chance to be in his company, I recommend that you do so and, and take some time to pepper him with questions. When we um, went into um, lockdown, I recall the story that he had told me after the Christchurch earthquakes and, and a number of other scenarios that he had faced around putting his team in a survive and thrive place and so he brought a number of his team a whole mixture of diverse and backgrounds and, and personalities and he put them in a space and said to them work out how we get through the next six months that's our survive team you lot over there you're the thrive team what is life after this space looking like so they were working independently then they'd come together share their ideas and peel off again and reformat themselves so we used that as an idea when we went into lockdown and through COVID and it was is something that didn't actually just stay with COVID. We use it now on all major issues that come our way. What's the survive response? What's the thrive response? Because there's always, well, one, they're probably always both required. And two, that it's sort of a, it's a yin and a yang. You need both of them to really come out in a strong position. Charlotte. Yeah, I hadn't heard it um, described in that way, <clears throat> but that's so succinct. And I, and I agree, I, same thing. You know, there's a, uh, in, a, in a completely boring version of that from a regulated environment um, in med tech in the past, there's always like containment and then corrective action, if you like, you know, it's kind of the, the horrible version of it, but it's like, what do we need to do? Um, it's always been, what do we need to do right now? And then and then what opportunities does this op open up for us? You know, so so what, what can we make of this? And Ben? Um, yeah, I'm struggling to put this one articulately, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, if I look back on what happened this time around, it taught us or it showed three things really clearly. Number one is that the technology was ready for us to work from home. Nobody realized that until we all went home and started teams meeting and watching Netflix at the same time and everything was there and ready and it worked. Um, it created this remarkable team spirit. It's like all of a sudden everybody was together and wanted the business to succeed because they all wanted their jobs and they wanted to get back to normal. And it uh, also promoted this thing about people looking after each other. And, you know, we had examples of people. I, I had examples of people writing to me to say, hey, you might want to touch base with such and such because they're on their own and they might not be doing so well. That kind of it's like people suddenly started looking out for each other. So those are the things that happened last time. And I guess how do you exploit the next global disruption was to look for those opportunities. But maybe they'll actually just emerge like these ones did. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting thing if you think about it, you know, there's a, there's a lot of businesses done really well out of the pandemic. And the question is, did they do well because they'd foreseen a pandemic and, and actually had a plan, just poison ready to happen? Or were they just in the right place at the right time? Those companies were lucky in my mind. So Teams and uh, Miro and you know Zoom, well done to you guys, because you were in the right place at the right time to something that was waiting to happen. To me, the clever thing though, is the businesses that pivoted and what you could say is the most important thing you could be in terms of ready for the next globally disruptive event, let's imagine it isn't a pandemic, it's something else, is just be, have a culture that's nimble. Um, be ready because the, the answer won't be there beforehand. It'll be there moments afterwards and it's how quickly you react to that. Which I'm going to give you one more underrated, overrated based on something you've just said, which was, you know, did they have a plan or did they do this or whatever? So here's the thing, underrated or overrated, the role of luck in business success. Ben? Underrated. Underrated. Charlotte? Yeah, underrated. And Rachel? Overrated. Overrated. <laughs> okay, nice. Um, our last question that we've got here, as we re-emerge into the world, what challenges do you think we have to face and how will we tackle those? So, uh, uh, Ben, I'll come to you first on this one. Mm. So one of the things we're grappling with right now is we've been kicked along this 
uh, sort of line of working from home and uh, how to how to make collaboration work across teams that don't sit together anymore. And as you come out of that, the, the most important thing is not to forget how successful it was and learn how to manipulate it to your advantage. So um, it was because I was first. It was the first thing off the off the top of my head. I might have come up with something better if, if I'd had more time, but. To me, that's like this opportunity there that actually could quite easily be squandered if what you do is just troop everyone back into the office and get them working the way they were. And I say this as a business that's about to build a brand new office building. And I can tell you, I am wondering if we've oversized the thing. <laughs> Thank you. Charlotte. Yeah, um, very much about our people and or or, or an organisation's people and and how they work and what, what the, and, and the impact that has on the culture or how the culture has to be to support that. And the reason I say that is, I think we've done and in, in Jade we've done a, a good job of coming back into a hybrid way of working where people have got you know, flexibility. Um, what we've started to see though during this year, partly because of the, the impact on you know, tech resources and so forth, is that some people have been um, sort of poached off to companies that are entirely virtual because, I, well, I can work remotely the whole time. This is great. You know, I, 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 this is what I want. But actually what we're starting to see now is that those people are starting to come back and go, uh, actually, the, the, the permanently remote thing doesn't, yeah, it's not everything I dreamed it would be. And, and so it's, it's, it's interesting sort of going, trying to understand where this thing's where the pendulum or the flux is going to be. And, um, and so creating, uh, being able to maintain a really strong culture, but within the bounds of, of the right kind of mix of flexibility. And, and again, I think co-creation's, you know, kind of the key to it, but, but I, you still have to have a strong hand on the tiller in terms of what culture it is you want to create. So, yeah, that. Nice. And Rachel? Yeah, I think I like that, Charlotte. I think there's sort of a PTSD almost as well with people and not, not fully knowing how to interact with one another, which is a challenge that we will all face. And you see it in various economies who have literally been locked down for two years. They're just a bit, I think, fearful to come out of that environment, uh, despite the inner person wanting to get there. Um, look, for me, I think one of the biggest challenges we've got um, globally coming out of the pandemic, and I actually I sort of reject the idea that we're coming out of pandemic. I think it'll be more just how do we live with this, this situation, is in and around... Um, inclusivity or, or lack thereof and then um, by association inequities that are showing themselves so whether you're a, or you're a MISME or you're a, a woman and uh, or you are an indigenous business um, you know you are literally at the uh, you know it's a perilous situation to be in and I think we've all seen the statistics around the number of women who who fell out of employment um, some of us might have seen what happens to indigenous businesses and indigenous economies when faced with these sorts of large scale catastrophic events in the way that economies often then move towards um, you know, really exploiting natural resources, which are really the heart and soul of indigenous economies. There's, the very perverse behaviors show themselves once we, we put ourselves under great stress. And so I think one of the challenges that we have is that how do we remain mindfully commercial and think it's actually not the way it was. And in fact, the way it was, wasn't exactly the utopia we might've imagined it was in the first place. So if we have a choice right now as to how we proceed, what will that look like? So let's determine our collective conscience as um, New Zealand business people and exporters and participants in our own society as to how we will respond in relation to one another. Mm, thank you. Okay, I'm good. So uh, we've, we've uh, come to the end of our time. I'm going to ask the panelists to do, uh, I haven't asked that they don't know what this is quite coming next, to do one small thing. So there might be something that um, you each have that was in the back of your mind that you thought, oh, I, I hope there's an opportunity to, to say this. This is a really important point that I would like to leave people with. So uh, do you have a sort of finishing final 30 second, uh, you know, hey, if there was something I'd just like to leave people with, this would be it. So if you don't, that's fine you can just say no I think we've actually covered things but there might be something that you were burning to say uh, so Charlotte I'll put you on the spot first um, anything you would like to finish with a 30 second uh, final thought uh, I feel like it's uh, if anything it's to do with people and I like the way Rachel put it earlier is knowing our people and continuing to know our people and I think that that to me is just that that thing which just really resonates through all the things we've said um, it keeps coming back to that for me. Nice. Uh, Rachel? Um, no, it's, it's not so much a statement as a, as a thank you. I think um, what I've noticed over the last 12 months of chairing ABAC 
is it's very hard to create this kind of interaction in a linear format. And, and so I really appreciate you creating the occasion where we can amongst ourselves have a conversation that I hope has been useful for people who are, have dialed in on their Wednesday evening. So thank you. Go on, Ben. So I'm, I'm going to say uh, something we've touched on already a couple of times, but I want to tell the story a little bit more, which is NZTE. And I can see um, my NZTE contact is on the um, uh, current attendees list, Imogene Lomax. Thanks, Imogene, for all the help you do for us. NZTE, uh, like I came, nice came from the UK. Nice little there. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> I came from the UK. I think I met a politician once in my life before coming to New Zealand. And now I've met 13, including two sitting prime ministers. We've got this like small country uh, ability, right? And it's powerful because there aren't, there are only 5 million people for a whole government. And it's the same government as you'd have in Canada or the US or whatever. So we've got this access to people. And one of the things that amazed me was NZTE. It's like, that's a service that I would have expected to pay for because NZTE do an enormous amount for us overseas. If we want a new distributor, we give them a formula, they will shortlist candidates in country, go and interview them, see them, come back, vet them and tell us about them. If we want to know how the pilot boat market works in South Korea, they'll go and look at it. They'll see who the boat builders are, who's, um, how many boats are built, who's the organization, who do you need to get at in the government if you're going to influence them. They've got this like incredible penetration into countries. And I would suspect that the guys uh, who are listening, who are run export businesses, if you aren't working with NZTE and you're here because you're wondering how you can succeed overseas, that's my top tip is just go and talk to them and find out what they can do. There you go, Charlotte. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, now, mihi nui ki na kai korero i tēnei pō. Na mihi nui ki na manahiri i tēnei pō hoki. Uh, so thank you very much to our panelists and speakers tonight. Thank you very much for your thoughts. Uh, thank you very much to all those who have attended as well. It's um, I, I have learned a lot uh, as we have done this. So uh, that is the end of our uh, of our time together. So once again, a very big thank you to our panelists. Uh, and there is where we will call it a day. So thank you very much for being with us this evening. If you do want to watch it again, it is recorded. Ka kiti Thank you.